Hello and welcome to Dub at the Cup, Keep Up's daily Women's World Cup podcast. I'm Teo Pelizzeri, joined by Matilda and Melbourne City forward Briley Henry. Briley, it's great to have you on Dub at the Cup. It's great to be here. So, very exciting time to be talking to you because you've been part of this Matilda's journey to the World Cup, making your international debut, and now you're watching your teammates go on this thrilling run. We'll get into the Matildas, but we also need to talk about today's results because we have two more teams going home and our first two teams going through to the quarter finalists. Let's talk about Spain and their massive 5-1 win against Switzerland. What impressed you about the match? I think it's great to see Spain bounce back from their big loss. You know, I think it's a side you can expect they're going to bounce back. They're real technical. Um, you know, they're amazing. So... I think they deserve to keep going through. Um, they maybe started off a bit rocky with that own goal, but I guess it happens. But I think the goals they scored, the fast, like the quick feet they had in the box, like not many teams you see do that. So I think it was amazing to see the, the goals they scored. And, yeah, it was, a, it was a good game, even though, you know, the goals were mostly only to Spain. They were all really good. The Spanish team, uh, are there players that you follow particularly closely or look to model your game on? I we speak to a lot of coaches uh, we speak to a lot of players and both Barcelona and Spain are teams that regularly get talked about as both individual players and overall teams that get studied by footballers looking to add to their games. Well, look, there's heaps in that team. You know, you've got Esther, Alexia. Um, but one that I think that she's sort of getting talked about now is, is Salma because um, she was at the World Cup when we were there. So I think to see her go from our World Cup and know she's our age, plays for Barca, which she absolutely kills it there. I've been watching her, quite a lot of her since we went to the World Cup with her lately. And I think, you know, she's just going to, the way she played at our World Cup and the way she's playing here, she's going to be a star soon. And yeah, she's our age. So I've been following her quite a bit. And that's the under 20 World Cup you're referring to there where your Australia team played against Salma Paraloilo's Spain team. She was in that Spain squad that beat Australia in the friendly last year, but she didn't get to make her international debut. She's since broken in and I think is only up to 10 caps. So what was it like to both play against her, but also meet her, given that she was a track and field athlete who chose football and it's obvious in her game, but she still has technical skills, not just pure athleticism. Oh, it was awesome to be able to meet her and play against her. Um, as people, she was she was really nice, and you know when you watch her on the field, like you said, you can see that athleticism from her track and field running, but her technical ability, like the way she, that left foot, she's on her left foot, then see you later, <laughs> um, and the way she can just, I think she has, she's real like Nikki as well. Like if the ball's sort of just right there, and there's a play again, a toe in, she always seems to you know keep it in or touch a pass, and she's real good like that. And you know she didn't make her international debut when Spain played against Australia, but now she's at a World Cup and she's starting most. Of game so yeah she's killing it. One of the beneficiaries of the 15 Spain players that that walked away and only some of them came back and she's one of the players that's held her spot in the team. How far can Spain go really though? They did lose 4-0 to Japan they may have bounced back here but is that enough to convince you that their good uh, has overcompensated for how bad they were and how shaky their defence looked against Japan in the 4-0 loss? (sighs) No like Look, if they play the way at their best, how they can play, then, yeah, they have a chance. Like, they definitely can do it. Um, But, yeah, like you said, there's some weaknesses in in their defence and their goals. I mean, look, tonight they may have won by a couple goals, but they scored an own goal as well, which is just, you know... In a, if you get to a quarter final or a semi final and you score that one, if you haven't scored yet and you're one, and then you end up one nil down, you might not get one back. So, you, in games like that, you can't afford to miss up. So, yeah, I don't know. Now, Mateus wasn't used off the bench tonight until the game was well and truly decided in terms of the margin. It seemed as though the trust is there in Aitana and she scored two goals. Uh, Spain made five changes going into this game. They, they've looked for a winning combination, they haven't necessarily found it. But how good is their best? I mean, when, when you watch them play the way they did, separating themselves from the Swiss today, are there other teams in this tournament? I mean, it's probably a good thing Australia can't play them until the final. But are, is there anyone on that side of the draw? USA, Sweden, the Netherlands, who they might have to play next? Is there anyone who you think can beat them when they're at their best? Well, it's a World Cup, so anyone can beat anyone, I guess. Um, when they're at their best. Oh, Netherlands sort of, I think, can sometimes match it a bit. But if they're playing the tiki-taka stuff and the technical stuff, like the way they turn players in the box, like to have that composure and be able to turn players in the box like they did tonight, I don't know if that's beatable, if they can play at their best, but also being able to play at their best every game and 
keep doing that is also a difficult task, so it could go either way. Now, having played against their under-20s, what similarities in how they played and the experience of playing them is reflected in how their seniors play? Would you say that the two teams are very closely aligned or were there some differences with their under-20s that maybe the senior team just takes to another level? Oh, well, look, they're both very technical and very athletic. Like, they're all very athletic, so they have both of that. I think as a nation, that's what makes them so good is that they have both sides of that. Um, I think the Nash, their senior team, obviously, technical and fine schools and execution are probably a little bit more, but I think their young team are very close, and I think when there's a whole new generation of senior teams coming through. I think Spain is my tip to be the next big thing. So probably be if close to like in that top five. <laughs> That's what I reckon. What was the number one thing you personally took away from playing against them? I think just the way, I think they regain the ball really quick. Like their regains, the same with their national, their senior team, sorry. They, like the way they regain their mentality is just like amazing. And also their movement, you know, when we played against them, in Gabera, who was ended up getting the golden boot, I think she got the silver ball as well, which she was insane. Her movement in the box to mark, like, and to watch her, like, I was at the other end of the field, but I could see it, and she was crazy, like, so smart. And to be at that age and already doing it is, yeah, amazing. It's probably the most I took away. Well, it's good that you did take something inspirational away from that game, even though the uh, Australian under-20s didn't win that afternoon. Let's talk about the other game, Japan. We know that they were on a roll. Hey, they finally conceded a goal at least, but they did beat Norway 3-1. It was level 1-1 for a little while this game, but Japan's quality told in the end. And I tell you what, Norway, they were their own worst enemy. An own goal and a really criminal giveaway for Japan's go-ahead goal. And then a very nicely taken Japan goal for 3-1. But I think the better team won, it's safe to say. Yeah, I think, you know, if you've watched Japan throughout this tournament, they're amazing. And, you know, they probably a team who can go all the way as well. Um, I think they've shown that. And, yeah, look, they conceded a goal and they probably could have conceded another one at the end there. The keeper made a really good save. But when they get in those positions, the, the passes that they thread through and then are able to finish and the composure they have is insane. So, yeah, they're, they're very good. Yamashita hadn't conceded a goal in this tournament and you mentioned the amazing clawing save to claw the ball off the line. Does it does it mean anything that the only goal Japan has conceded is from a header and that amazing save was from a header? Is that the way to beat Japan? Um, they probably won't like playing Sweden next if the Swedes get through because we know that with Sweden, it's going to be a barrage of aerial balls, set pieces and lots of headers. Well, if you're watching that, that'd be something and, you know, you're, that's a strength of yours. I certainly would go into that game going, you know, if we can get set pieces or get long balls in there, um, Japan aren't necessarily the tallest team. And, you know, the keeper did make a, a clawing save at the end to save it, but that's not going to happen every time. So I think that, yeah, that's probably a weakness of theirs and one way to beat them. We don't know who these two teams, Spain and Japan, will be playing in the quarterfinals. We will do our tips later as part of Dub at the Cup. Let's talk a bit of Matildas because we're getting closer to Monday. Now, you've been to a Matildas game. You saw the game against Ireland. You've got your tickets for Monday night, I understand. I do. Are you going <laughs> with a crew, family? Have you got just one on your own? What's the situation for... Monday night for you? I'll be with my family and Kirsty and Prinny will be there with me as well. And so it's Kirsty Fenton and Princess Sabini? Yeah. Great to hear. So <laughs> hanging out with a couple of uh, Sydney FC players though. Yeah, uh, rivals. Don't know. <laughs> yeah, rivals, good shout. Um, what have you made of the, of the week? Everyone's been able to exhale. That's probably the biggest thing I've taken away. We've seen the footage of the Matildas at training. They look so relaxed and happy. Nothing really of any great note has come out of the media conferences. What does that say to you? You've been in that environment. How, how important is it, do you think, that the Matildas at the moment are not feeling the stress the same way they were before the Canada game? Oh, I think it's a massive relief. I think when you have that in, you might get players. I mean, they're all very experienced and they've all probably, most of them have been in, that, in those situations before. But I think when you have all that stress, you maybe start to overthink a few things, which is not the best because I think you play the best when you're not thinking and when you're happy. So, yeah, that's definitely a massive sigh of relief. And I think it's also a good confidence boost. It's going to be like, well, we can do it. You know, when our back's against the wall and that's probably when they play their best, they can do it. Um, but also pressure, pressure is, you know, great to have. You know, only, have, only good teams have it. So, but now they can take a sigh of relief and know that they can do it. They're going to have the same pressure, but they've been there before. And they have, yeah, they'll be fine, I reckon. As a current player, how much do you, do you wish that it was you in that camp right now? I know we're four years away from the next World Cup and that'll be your goal. There'll be an Olympics before then. But when you see them in that training environment, regardless of whether it's back to the wall or whether it's all rolling downhill like it has been this week, 
how much do you visualise, oh, I would love to be in that training camp environment counting down to the game on Monday? Oh, you can't put that into words. That's, I would love to be there so much. Um, God, that would, yeah, I, I don't even know what to say. I would love to be there. Um, I think having, you know, being there and being able to wear that jersey and go out and play at a home World Cup would be amazing. You know, when you go to the game, I think going to the game and sitting in the crowd and watching it makes you get that hunger because you sit there and you think, like, crap, this is so cool, like the atmosphere. Just being able to play, sing the national anthem, um, yeah, I think it makes you so much more hungry sitting there watching it and, yeah, well, I would love to be there and hopefully the next one. You, you've, had, you've had that opportunity. You've worn that Matilda shirt. You are a Matilda forever. Can't take that away, which is great. But what do you think it's doing to the rest of the country? Because you're close. You're right there, you know, hoping to step into that team. What do you think it's doing? Imagine yourself at 12 or at 8 or when you first started playing. What effect do you think this Matilda's team is having on that person out there right now? Oh, I think it's crazy. Um... Like, it, the effect that this will have on young players. Like I said, whether you're sitting at home or sitting in the crowd, obviously sitting in the crowd is much better. You can feel the atmosphere and watching it. I think if you're, you know, used to going out, say 12 year old going out and playing park soccer, um, you know, when you have the, the cheering of your mum and dad in, in the crowd, which is already loud, imagine being in a whole stadium. So I think that just, like, having that will be, would be amazing. I think it will just make kids so much more hungry to think that they can do it. And I also think the way that the Matildas, you know, the way it's all being advertised and the way the Matildas are, I think everyone feels, you know, you can see they're a close-knit family, which they are, but I feel like everyone in the crowd feels like they're a part of that family as well. So I feel like that also gives some more inspiration and, you know, excitement to the younger players because they want to be a part of that. And, you know, it gives them something to work to. And I think, yeah, it'll, it'll do amazing things. Just quickly on the actual football, um, Tony Gustafsson, you've played for him now. You've been part of his coaching environment. Uh, the Matildas have had to, due to Sam Kerr's injury, Mary Fowler's concussion, maybe a few positional switches, they've had to change the attacking line and who they've subbed on in attack in every game. There hasn't been the consistency that they would have hoped for. How do you think Tony Gustafsson is handling that? And how does he talk to the attacking unit as a group? What sort of instructions was he giving you, but also what sort of instructions does he give all his attackers, regardless of whether they're starting or on the bench? Yeah, I think he'll be having those subgroup meetings, um, like similar to when I was in there, you know, break break the positions up, so have your defenders, your midfielders and your attackers and break them up so they can really focus on their jobs and go through their pressing and what he wants them to do together. But I think it'll also be a lot of just let them play how they play. You know, attacking's all about being creative and, you know, you're, you're there for a reason because everyone brings their own quality and their own strengths to the team. So I think... You know, he'll, he'll, he'll talk to them, but also let them be on their own because they know what they bring. He'll give them that confidence and then just let them go out there, play free, combine. When you're playing freely, playing happy is how they all play at their best. And how much of the coaching is about not overloading the players? When you say freedom, creativity, how much of that is making sure that the coach isn't just bombarding the, the players with too much information and lets them work a few things out for themselves? Well, I think a lot of it because they've had, look at the lead up they've had. They've had so many international friendlies. They had the Cup of Nations. They're, they've had all that prep to go through, you know, their playbook and go through all the all the tactics they want to play. And not much would have changed because it would have been all preparing for this because this is the, the final thing, the big thing they want to be, they want to prepare for. So I think now it's, yeah, they know what they've got to do tactically. Um, you know, maybe touch on a few things depending on the team you're going to play, obviously. But, yeah, a lot of it will be just let them be. They're in a World Cup. They already know the pressure that's coming from the outside, coming from the inside. So just let them be creative and do what they want to do. And just one last one on the game. Um, what do you like as a supporter? If you're going along with uh, Kirsty Fenton, Princess Sabini and your family, are you the annoying one that they're going to have to calm down? Or is there someone else in your little group that's going to be the one that everyone's going to have to calm down before the game kicks off? Are you genu generally OK? Like... How, how are you as a supporter of the team in the stands? Look, if they're going to score, obviously I'm going to go up. I think we'll all be like that. Um, my mum will probably go the most crazy, I'd say. <laughs> She'll be the one we have to calm down. But, um, no, we're generally, generally OK. I think we'll all, we'll all be into it, and I think we'll all feel the nerves at the start as well. <laughs> Excellent. Well, we're going to talk a little bit more about your game later on Dub at the Cup and also counting down to the next Liberty A-League season as well. Right now, though, we're going to get some Danish perspective because we've lined up an expert, Amelie Bremer. Let's hear what she had to say about the Denmark team. I mean, obviously for the players, they've said all along, also when being critiqued a little bit about how the games have been played and the, the game have uh, the, the playing haven't been so well. And the Danish team is always saying, 
excuse me, we know you, you, you have the right to critique us, but we want to win either way. If we play like hell, uh, if we play ugly or whatever, but we win the match, we are happy in, in that respect. Um, so they want to win no matter what. And in that perspective, obviously, it would be easier in quotation for Denmark if Sam Kerr doesn't play. Uh, but from everyone else uh, around women's football in Denmark, obviously, we want to see the biggest players, the biggest matchups. Um, and we would all love to see Sam Kerr in this World Cup, I think. Um, she's a player that that a lot of Danish people know. Um, from the connection, obviously, with Penilla Harder in, in Chelsea, also from just being a uh, cover on, on the FIFA play, uh, FIFA game, sorry. Um, so, so she is a, a name in women's football that a lot of uh, people uh, also, I mean, uh, people outside of the, the more nerdy women's football circles <laughs> would know. Um, so in that perspective, she's also someone that people will, will want to tune in to see. Yes, a big thanks to Emily Bremer. Dub of the Cup continues. We've got Briley Henry here. And Briley, we're going to talk England now. How impressed have you been with them? Three wins from three heading into this game against Nigeria. And there's one player that has been the talk of the football world. Look, I've been impressed with them, especially their last game. I think their first two games, they probably weren't at their best from what we know that they can play. And I think the last game they played, they have started to come into form, which is awesome because this is when you want to start peaking in a tournament which is what I think they're going to do um and yeah Lauren James she's insane the goals she's scoring she's so young um not just scoring but assisting as well so yeah look she's big for them and she her composure in the box and her technique to finish um but also the way she sets other players up to score and the passes she finds is insane yeah she's amazing in a great position to be the player of the tournament would you agree in, obviously you'd think the player of the tournament their team would have to at least make the semis maybe even the final but england's good enough to get there aren't they they are when like i said they're coming into form now their last game they really played really played well how we know they can and yeah i think if she if they keep going um, yeah, she's definitely in contention for that. She's not, you know, she's, every game she's been amazing. Well, let's get a bit more insight into this England team. Keep Up's James Dodd caught up with former Melbourne Victory star and former England international Natasha Dowie. They've gone into this tournament as favourites, or if not one of the favourites with probably USA. And they probably haven't had that kind of pressure on them in the past. Yes, they've just won the Euros, which is massive. So to have this added pressure now, which maybe they're not used to, maybe, you know, first couple of games told them a bit, only just beat Denmark 1-0 as well. But then that injury to Kira Walsh, I mean, horrific as it is, because for me, she's our star player or one of our star players. And the way that England play and have played for the last two years has gone so heavily through her. You know, that kind of holding midfield role, she dictates the way that England plays. And almost losing her woke everyone else up, I feel, because then... Your Russo started performing. Your Lauren Hemps, who have been quiet uh, for club and country of late, turned up. You know, your Rachel Daly's are involved in the goals. Lauren James then kind of gets her chance in the second game and, you know, has pretty much lit the World Cup on fire within the last two games. Three goals, three assists. So I almost feel like you don't want to lose Akira Walsh, but changing the formation to that 3-5-2 has almost helped England a little bit as well. And I think that 6-1 you know, performance against China was pretty impressive. And I think it's come at the right time because I think if we had just been winning games 1-0, it would have been a bit nervy now going to the round of 16. But I think after that performance and result, they'll be full of confidence going up against this Nigeria team. So a big thanks to Natasha Dowie and also James Dodd. That's England-Nigeria. But uh, Briley, what games have you had tickets for and where else have you been other than the Matildas so far in this World Cup? The most recent one I went to was Colombia and Germany. And that was insane. Um, you know, big upset first off, but the atmosphere then was like, you'd think you're playing in Colombia. Um, it was so loud. When they sung the national anthem, we were right amongst all the Colombian fans. So we were in like the best spot and it was like, it was amazing. I think the atmosphere they have and that's probably like, that helped them to win for sure. But also they're a great team. On top of the cup, Grace Ma has already predicted that they would become a lot of Australians second team. Is that how is that the impression that left you feeling after watching that amazing game? That both the experience in the stadium, but also the football they played. Yeah, hundred percent. Like they just, they're all so passionate about it. You know, you think you're playing in England. Um, they're just the, and they're also happy. I think they bring such a good vibe, um, and they get real into it. And I think it was just funny. You know, they had all the booing against the Germany when they were they were going for a corner or anything like that. And yeah, I think they're just a team. They're sort of a team that I think you. 
you can't, even if they were to beat Australia, I think it's sort of a team you wouldn't really hate. It's sort of a team you love just because the culture they show and the culture their fans show. So, yeah, I think it would, would become a second favourite team. Well, one team that is out of the tournament but certainly won a lot of hearts and minds during this World Cup has been the Philippines. And, of course, they've got a very strong connection to the Liberty A-League. One of their biggest stars and their goal scorer at this World Cup was Serena Bolden. Keep up, caught up with her. Once kind of stage came on, you taught us so many invaluable things as a team and individually as me as a football player that we take with us and I take with myself for the rest of my life. Um, the things that they taught us were life-changing um, and we're eternally grateful and I mean I don't think anyone could have imagined the impact that he made and the staff made and um, not only do they teach us, you know, tactical and soccer things, but life things of to always back yourself, be confident and fight for, you know, what's right and, you know, have a plan, have a game plan. We're not just going to go in hoping and praying. Um, we're going to have <clears throat> an outline of our principles and what we're going to do. And that's what he taught us. That's what the staff taught us. And um, I think that's the reason why it got us so far. So um, sad to see him leave. And obviously he's, you know, making the move to Perth. But we wish him all the best of luck and, you know, we have this experience for the rest of our life that we share with him, but we also keep and, you know, we hope it propels us forward because, you know, how we have this beautiful and this strong foundation now because of him and, um, you know, we hope it propels us forward and continues to help, you know, Philippine football gain traction and continue to succeed. Dub at the Cup continues and, of course, one of the things we love about Dub at the Cup is that we get to talk about the Liberty A-League. And if you are 16 and under, make sure you go to keepup.com.au forward slash LAP. That's Liberty A-League Pass, LAP, because if you are 16 and under, you can register to go to the games for free and you can see the stars of today and tomorrow, like Briley Henry of Melbourne City. Briley, you had such a great season with Melbourne City last campaign, but fell short in the final series. How much has that motivated you through this off-season? We know that you're playing in New South Wales in the NPL for the Bulls Academy team over the winter, but how much are you burning to get back down to Melbourne for that first day of pre-season? I don't, don't think I've been this excited for a pre-season in a long time. Um, I'm so excited to get back down there. Um, yeah, we fell just short last year, but we played some great football and I think we definitely deserve to be there with the way we played, but, you know, we fell short and we didn't win that game, so then... We didn't make it, and that's football. But, yeah, I'm burning to get back down there and get back into it and, you know, hopefully go all the way this season. We know that uh, the Melbourne City men's A-League team has been announcing plenty of players, but not too many names for the women's team yet. Right now, though, do you need that many? I mean, they've got Holly McNamara, they've got yourself, they've got a really good young core of players. How much are you, as sort of late teens, early 20s, that core ready to take control and sort of grow into this team and come through as a generation? Oh, I think we're all so ready, you know, excited. A lot of us young ones have had a couple of seasons now. You know, even Danny, that was her first season, but she played a lot of minutes. She's been with the young Matildas. Um, she's got that experience. So I think we've all had that, that year together and look what we already did as a first year together as a young team. So I think, yeah, this year it's literally just building off that, getting more confidence and just playing freely and just going to those games with confidence and playing the way we know we play. And I think, yeah, we're all excited to take it by the reins no matter the age or, yeah, whatever we are, we're just excited and we're hungry. Now, I don't know if you've been watching NPL Victoria, but they've been uh, down there. Caitlin Torpy's been playing as a centre forward um, and she's scoring a lot of goals. Are you going to have some unexpected competition or do you think you're going to say, Torps, go back to right wing back? We know that's where you're a great player. Maybe leave the forward line to me and Holly back. <laughs> It's funny you say that because she actually was bragging to us the other week about the hat-trick she scored. Um, well, we might have some competition, I don't know. But, you know, I think actually when we come back down there, we're all going to be like, Torps, you're our right back. Get back in there and just stay, stay at the back, stay quiet. <laughs> now, your player of the season, Julia Grosso, she has hectic social media presence. Like, um, I can only imagine, I asked Kode Rojas this on Dub Zone, how difficult is she to live with? And Kode was very diplomatic and said she was lovely. What is Julia Grosso like as a teammate and is Australia ready for her to return to this country because it seems as though she's ready to take her game to another level after having a very impressive first season? Look, I don't know if they're ready for her because I think she's going to come back firing and she's going to be even better than she was last season. Um, 
in terms of living with her and having her around the team, she's great fun. She's one of those players who's always happy. She's positive. She brings great vibes. And I think it's great to have someone like that in the team, you know. It's just always happy. It's fun. Um, and that shows on the field when you're playing. So if you have someone like that in the team, it's great. So, yeah, nothing bad for me. <laughs> no, I, and I can imagine she would be an incredible person for lifting uh, the morale and the spirit. Because the grind of training, and I know that Melbourne City trained hard. You know, Patrick Kuznorbo, when he was the A-League women's coach, I mean, he, he had a reputation for, you know, the fittest team, the hardest workers. And that seems to have stayed with Melbourne City. So as far as what you're working on personally in your game, what are the things you're trying to refine? What are the things you're trying to improve? And where do you see your game going to the next level in summer? Look, I really want to focus on my finishing and getting that composure. Um, you know, I'm going back down to my second season there, so I've already played with a lot of the girls. But really refining on, you know, I think I find myself in a lot of good positions up there. And um, I know my teammates have a lot of good teammates around me, so they're going to put me in good space and find positions. And it's really about scoring some more goals. That's what I'm thinking about every time I get on that field. So scoring goals or assisting goals and really being clinical in that final position and hopefully going all the way. But, yeah, I'm so hungry to get back down there and just work really hard and try and have a really good season. And we've spoken about the motivation of getting to pull on that green and gold shirt again and, and add to your two caps that you've already got for Australia, but how did it feel seeing some of your under 20s teammates like Sarah Hunter and also Charlie Rule get their big move to Europe? Because the A League's getting longer, you've got 22 games this coming season, so hopefully, hey, double figure goals or <laughs> as many as you can score. But what did it mean to see those two at still a pretty young age, your contemporaries, make the big move one going to Paris FC, one going to Brighton and Hove Albion? Look, I couldn't be more proud of them. They're two of my best friends. Um, and we've grown up playing together from, you know, our first days at Institute when we were younger to all the camps we've been through. So to see them make that move at such a young age when you look at the Matildas, they all went over, you know, sort of late 20s. So for them to be going over 19 and 20 is amazing. And I'm so proud of them and I know they're going to do really well. And, um, you know, it was surreal. I remember we went away, the group of us, after the World Cup last year and we all sat, we were on the beach and we sat around a fire and we all spoke about how our lives were going to change pretty soon and that was all just about going to different teams in the A-Leagues and then, you know, it was sort of uh, um, still up in the air, you know, thinking, oh, maybe we'll all play overseas soon and now they've done that. So it's surreal and it's, you know, it's amazing to see them do so well but it also is going to put the light on here, you know, they're going to go from here and they're getting, they're bringing so many players from the A-League signed for those big clubs at a young age so... They're going to go over there and do well, which is then teams and stuff are going to be like, well, where did they come from? They came from the A-League. So it's going to do great things here and great things for them. It's incredible to, to hear that story about setting goals for yourselves. Who's your Premier League team or what's the dream team that you want to play for overseas? Look, I have to say Chelsea. <laughs> that would be an absolute dream to play there. Well, uh, score as many as you can in the A-League women's. You never know, sky's the limit. Um, <laughs> let's take a look at the World Cup games that are coming up on uh, Sunday in Australia, and they are both in Australia. New Zealand had the two on Saturday. We get a midday kickoff in Sydney. Now, the reason it's midday is the uh, FIFA thought this was going to be America, and America didn't top their group. <laughs> so it's the Netherlands against South Africa. South Africa have taken the lead in every game they've played. They only beat Italy, but they did take the lead against Sweden and they did take the lead against Argentina. Can they do it again to the Netherlands? Who do you think is going to win and why? That's a hard one. Um, I think South Africa is sort of an underdog team. I think they'll be one of the dark horses. Um, they definitely have the ability to score. You know, they've got speed. Um, so, look, if they can take the lead, it's all about holding that, which in games like that, if you take the lead really early, you can't settle because it's all going to be about who turns up on the day. But... Look, I'd probably have to tip, tip Netherlands. Um, they're a very good team, and if they can, they can turn up the day and play the way they can play, I think they should get away with the win. And, of course, the winner of that game gets Spain in the quarterfinal. Now, at 7pm in Melbourne, the city of Melbourne, you, you've never called it Melby, have you? No. <laughs> no. What did you think when you saw the United States called it Melby? Oh, Cringe? That's yeah. what I thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've only lived there for a year. I lived there for 30. So, you know, no, no bueno. Yeah. We're, we're not calling... <laughs> nah. No Melbourne. No Melbourne. No. Um, let's talk about the actual game. 7 p.m. kickoff, United States versus Sweden. This could be the final. It's a good enough game to be the final. Two similar styles in terms of bash and crash, pace and power, extreme physicality, reliance on set pieces. Will Sweden just do it better than America? Or does America need to mix up their game and find a different way to win? 
I think they do need to find a different way to win and mix it up a bit. I think, you know, when coming into this World Cup, everyone thought America, you know, world champions, best team, world ranked number one. So they thought big things. But I wouldn't say I think they've sort of flown a bit under the radar and they haven't played as good as everyone has expected them to. So I think Sweden probably have the tip going into this game. Um, I think they can definitely do it if they play the way they can. You know, America, I don't think has hit form or hit their peak. So... I think Sweden, yeah, they're both similar ways of play, but I think if Sweden can get up first and then maybe score another goal, I think I see Sweden running away with it. Wow, big call. Well, we yeah. know America backs to the wall, but they need to show us something new. I agree. I, what they've shown us so far won't get it done against Sweden. Briley Henry, it's been so much fun having you on Dub at the Cup. I'm looking forward to commentating more of your goals during the Liberty A-League season this summer. And in the meantime, enjoy the rest of the NPL campaign. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on. Thank you for having me. And don't forget, you can keep following Keep Up's World Cup coverage on Facebook, Instagram, keepup.com.au, wherever you get your social media. Don't forget the Twitter as well. And you can subscribe to the podcast every day on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. I'm Teo Pelizzeri. On behalf of Briley Henry, this has been Dub at the Cup, and we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Wonderful.